the sinfulness and all the things we're not supposed to be doing that we still do, they'll take care of themselves in the long run if we continue to let Christ lead us. And he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, uh, for the remission of your sins, so that you may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then it goes on to say, you know, he continues to preach, telling them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation, meaning we need to keep doing what we're supposed to do. At the end of the chapter, what do we need to be doing? And I think we touched on a little bit. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And either in this class, we're talking a lot about Acts. I don't know if we talked about this Sunday, but we're talking about it last week. Can you imagine being in a gospel meeting somewhere and having 3,000 people come to Jesus? You know, admittedly, there were probably 100,000 people in Jerusalem at the moment because they're all there for what? <laughs> but even still, 3,000 people is a whole lot of people. You know, meetings where there four or five people baptize and accept Christ, and even that's cool. There's 3,000 people who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. I wish we still had revivals like that today. I wish we could still see the Holy Spirit working in such a powerful way that scores of people would respond to the invitation and come to make Jesus Christ Lord of their life. But here we got 3,000. Questions about any of that? Talk about it? So then the next question I want us to just touch on a little bit is, what is repentance? What is repentance to you? What is it? Asking God for salvation. Say it again. Asking God for salvation. Asking God for salvation. Okay. Asking God for forgiveness of your sins. Okay. Asking for forgiveness of sins. Changing one, changing one mindset. Changing one's mindset. Okay. It's acknowledging you did something wrong. Okay, an acknowledgement you need to do something because you've done something wrong. Regret. What? Regret. It's a regret. Okay, feeling sorry, wishing you hadn't done it. Bob, you want to say something? No, I... You want to say what Wendell's going to say? Okay. Yeah. And I think it's all of that in a sense because all of that is incorporated in the idea that Christ is our Savior and we want to make him that in our lives. And so we change things, we repent. First point in, in this Wendell's comment, it's a conversion from something to something. In order to repent, there's got to be a change. And really that's what repentance means. It's a change of something. And you repent from, and I really think this Acts 2 situation, it's a repentance from killing Jesus to wanting to turn around and live in a way where we're not killing Jesus, where we're not carrying on the kind of lifestyle uh, that would cause us to have that reflection in our life, that we're rejected the Savior. Uh, so it's a change from something. It isn't just being sorry. It isn't just saying, oops, I did something wrong. It isn't even just asking for forgiveness, because repentance carries with it a change of some kind. And if you can say to Jesus, I'm sorry, please forgive me, I'm going to get baptized, and then your life doesn't reflect any change at all. You go right back to doing what you were doing before. You don't really give a hoot what God wants in your life. You haven't biblically repented of anything. You may have asked for forgiveness. You may have been sorry for what you've done. But unless your life reflects a change, you haven't repented because that's what that word repentance means. It's a change from one lifestyle to another lifestyle. And I think all of us, even those of us who have been Christians for a long, 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 long time, every once in a while we need to stop and ask ourselves, is Christ really Lord of my life? Is he ruling my life? Or does he rule some of it? You know, and there's a real neat story out. It's quite old. It talks about a guy who owns a house and he lets Christ to come into his house and he walks into the living room and he's cleaned up all of his stuff he shouldn't have in there and he lets him into the kitchen he throws all of his alcohol and stuff away and I'm not criticizing alcohol it's just where the story goes 
he goes into the bedroom and his sexual life is right, everything's where it's supposed to be, and God's walking around, he's walking around the house with him, saying, you've done great, this is awesome, this is awesome. They get up to the top, top story, the second level, and down at the end of the hallway, some of you have heard this, there's a closet. And Jesus says, well, let's go in here. And the man says, oh, no, 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 you can't go in there. That's the room I reserved for myself. You can't have that room. I don't think Jesus wants eight of our rooms. He wants all nine. He wants everything in our life. And when we're confessing to him and saying, I'm going to change from living for myself to living for you, it's going to be all of it. You know, it's that song we sing, all to Jesus I surrender. And there are times I think we sing that song and we're lying through our teeth. Mm -hmm. you know, but we haven't for a moment decided to surrender some parts of our lives because we're just not willing to we struggle with it. And we may have a hope that we will someday. We may have a desire to do that. But if we're not working on getting our lives totally turned over to Christ, we probably, probably got to ask ourselves, have I ever really repented? Because you can play it being a Christian and say, I'm going to let God have every aspect of my life except this one. You haven't repented. The whole idea behind repentance is a full turn. That's not to say just because you've sinned, you haven't repented. Because again, God knows our hearts. He knows if you're serious about trying to quit, if you're trying to let things go, if you're trying to live the way he wants you to live, and you're just struggling with something. That's a big difference than saying, I'm just not going to let this part of me go. And the one example I always think of when I talk about this is a guy I talked to once who said, I've just got a hot temper. You know, and you're just going to have to put up with my hot temper. That's just my cross to bear, and I'm hot tempered, and I'm always going to be hot tempered, and people are just going to have to take me the way I am. And my answer to him was, God doesn't take you like that. He doesn't want you to have a hot temper. And if you're just excusing your behavior by saying you've got a hot temper. You need to turn that over to God. You need to let him take that hot temper away from you. Because he doesn't want you to have a call. Well, I think it's easier in those days to stay saved as opposed to today. Today we get so much stuff, you know, through the mail, emails, and you know, TVs and things like that, and people have a tendency to not be able to stay saved as, as easy as it used to be. Yeah, you know, because you when you you actually worked on a farm, you basically you out there and you had the chance to read the Bible. That was the only thing you had to read. There was no no, no radios, no TVs, or anything like that. If people read that and you know they, they did their work and that was it. I mean, most part of the film. I don't know that I'd agree with you that it's easier. We may have more distractions, and by that's why it's easier to have for them than us. I got a funny feeling because I read Paul's letters, and we just talked about this on Sunday morning in, in the sermon where he says in Colossians chapter 2, you need to put to death these things, and you, people used to do that. And then he goes on to say, and you also still need to get rid of all these other things. He doesn't say you used to live that way. These are, he says, now you need to get rid of this. And so, Paul, there may be more distractions in, in the world today and, and an easier access to sinful things. I suppose you look at it that way. The things of the heart haven't changed one bit. Satan was still active then. Absolutely. Just as he is sure. now. And I can still be jealous. I can still be envious. I can still be hot-tempered. I can still lie. Those are the things Paul mentioned. The same kind of things that you and I look at today and, and tell little white lies because it's easier to do that than not, or envy somebody who's got something that I haven't got, or talk about other people because that's just what we do. Those are the same things Paul says in the first century. You people still need to get rid of this stuff. I think we still, I still struggle with some of those things. So, you know, but yeah, I think you're right. In a sense, Paul, we have more distractions. News is much quicker to come our way. Uh, it's more, we have more access to stuff we shouldn't have access to. In that sense, it's easier for us to find sin if we want it. But I don't think our hearts are any different. Because I got a feeling people back in those days, they had prostitutes in the first century. You could steal somebody's pig in the first century. 
you can have all the same mindsets of, I'm going to do what I want to do. It might have been harder to do it, to get to it. But I think it's still a matter of the heart. Do I want to do what God wants me to do? Or do I, I want to do what I want to do? And that's the repentance. I'm going to turn from my own selfish lifestyle to a lifestyle ruled by God. Knowing all along I'm going to screw it up from time to time. I'm going to do things I shouldn't do. I'm going to give in to that fleshly nature that Paul talks about in Colossians. Because Satan's still out there, absolutely. He's still here trying as hard as he can to mess with our heads. But it's a heart thing. Am I willing to give up my life to do what God wants me to do? That's repentance. That's the goal behind repentance. As a, it's a turnaround. It's being remoted. It's being transformed. It's being converted it involves having a faith relationship with Jesus. And that's where the trouble comes in, I think, with keeping the check boxes. I go to church on Sunday. Look at us. We're at church on Wednesday. Oh, we're really nice people. Look at how we get a check mark for that. You know, I did my homework assignment. I memorized my Bible verse. I, we get all these checklists of look at how what a great Christian I am. And sometimes we put our faith in stuff, doing things, than we do in, in Jesus Christ. And who in the New Testament had that problem? Hmm. What's your question? Who in the New Testament had a problem with doing things but didn't have a heart for God? <coughs> Come on, y'all know the answer to this. Judas? No, not who I'm thinking of. Peter. Well, Peter's messed up a time or two. This is a lifestyle. Who did Jesus criticize the most? Pharisees. The Pharisees. Yeah, Pharisees. the religious rulers. Remember Jesus over and over and over says, you people, you speak and then speak, but inside you're like a, an empty tomb full of dead men's bones. They could check off all the list. We go to the temple, we sacrifice, we do this, we do that. And Jesus looks at them and says, you don't get it. And he even tells the people, do what they say, don't do what they do. Because they're not living the life they're supposed to be living. They think they've got all the rules down pat, but their heart's all messed up. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're not loving people the way they're supposed to be loving people. And so they didn't have a faith in, of course, they didn't have faith in Christ. They didn't have a faith in God. They had a faith in themselves that we can do it right and justify ourselves. It's the law. Yeah. And nothing's changed from the Old Testament to the New. It's still faithfulness. It still is my faith in God or is my faith in keeping a bunch of rules. We had an example this morning. We were studying the Bible with somebody. And we're studying Acts. Everywhere I'm at, we're studying Acts. We're way ahead in the other class. <laughs> But he said, you know, why do we have our calendars all mixed up? Because we've got Sabbath as, a, as the first day of the week, and Sunday should be the last day of the week. And I said, Sunday's not the Sabbath. Saturday was the Sabbath. Sunday is Sunday. It is the first day of the week. And we talked about that a while, and, and he said, my whole life I believed that the Sabbath was Sunday. And we've got their calendars all messed up because... That's what he's been taught. And a lot of churches teach that, that God just moved the Sabbath from the Saturday to Sunday. No, he didn't. There's an indication of that at all in the New Testament, that we have a new Sabbath. And Paul, in fact, says in some of his letters, don't let people judge you by Sabbath-keeping or not Sabbath-keeping or any of these other holy days. Those days no longer matter. But some people still think you've got to keep the rules. You've got to do it. And we talked with, with him, and you know, it was clear that's just what he'd been taught. He'd picked that up somewhere along the way in church. And that was his mindset with, well, Sabbath is Sunday now. And no, it's not. It's, it isn't. But we, if we're not careful, we listen to the preacher, we listen to the Bible study teacher, we listen to somebody, and we hear all this stuff, and it just soaks it up, and we never really think about it on our own. We never really study it ourselves. So we need to be careful that we're not trying to be right with God simply by keeping a bunch of rules. It's a faith relationship. Bob, you want to say something? 
I'll go ahead. Wait up. Why is it that we always remember the wrong stuff? <laughs> <laughs> because Satan comes along and he wants us to remember the wrong stuff. And he's got a lot of people working to make us remember the wrong stuff. If Satan can convince all of us that all Christianity is, is going to church on Sunday and a Bible study once during the week, and that's it. If he wins. what he wants to do. He wants you and me to believe it's just a matter of keeping rules. It isn't a matter of keeping rules. It's having faith in Jesus Christ and letting him rule our lives. Last point, and we touched on this a little bit. It's a change of mind that leads to a change of behavior. The aim of repentance is that we should accept what God has intended for us. And if I accept Christ as my Savior, he's Lord of my life, he's this Messiah, then I want to do what he wants me to do, don't I? That's my goal. And, you know, we, we talk about this a lot. What should your attitude be when you do something wrong? Forgiveness. Yeah, you want forgiveness. You're sorry for what you've done. And if you, you know, Paul talks about this in Romans 6. You can't continue in sin that grace may have found. Apparently some Romans thought, well, God's forgiven me of all this stuff. I just do whatever I want to do. Paul says, you can't do that. How can you, if you died to that lifestyle, continue to live in it? And so the challenge for all of us, at least for me, is to regret when I do something wrong. To feel sorry. To have a, an attitude of regret, as you said, Susan. I don't want to do that. I want to be forgiven. And I'm sorry when I do stuff, and I think that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. Even while you're doing something wrong, somewhere in your mind there should be this thought of, this is not right. I shouldn't be doing this. But you do it anyway sometimes. And I've said before, if you can sin with impunity, do things you know that's wrong and not give one care at all, saying, well, I'm okay with this. God's going to forgive me anyway. You need to recheck whether you have a relationship with Jesus or not. Because if you're truly made Jesus Lord of your life. An attitude that says I can do whatever I want to whenever I want to do it. Is it consistent with having made Christ Lord of your life? And so if you can live that way, you may be wanting to recheck whether you really have a relationship, if you've really repented. Because you're still living the way you want to live. You're just saying you're a Christian. I'll let God have my Sunday morning. I'll let him have Monday night. I'll give him Wednesday night. If he didn't get Friday afternoon, that's mine. I'm going to do whatever I want Friday afternoon. You haven't truly repented. You're just trying to play the, the odds. And I don't think it works, Paul. Well, you know, if you read something, to me, you know, people interpret things differently. You know, when you read something, you look up something and read three, three people say something about it, and it's different. And I, I, I saw a example. If you talk about the Holy Spirit, the book of Acts has it, it, uh, more than the four disciples had. You know, Reference, Matthew, Mark, yeah, Luke, Matthew, yeah, Matthew, 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 so the Holy Spirit can come. That's why there's not so much of the Holy Spirit in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus was there. He was God on earth. Once he left, God sent his spirit to guide the church, to help the church, to help people who want to follow Jesus live the way we're supposed to. Because Jesus isn't here to help us anymore. But you're right. It's clearly more Holy Spirit activity in Acts than in the four Gospels. But I think that's why. Because the Holy Spirit wasn't indwelling humanity until Acts comes along. That's one of those promises here in Acts chapter 2. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so when we accept Christ as our Savior, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The apostles didn't get that. The Jews didn't get that. Nobody in the Old Testament got that. They would get the Holy Spirit for a while. 
And then once it was done doing what they were doing, the Holy Spirit would leave. You and I have the Holy Spirit continuously. Even when we're doing something wrong, yeah. we still have the Holy Spirit. And that's why Paul talks about don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't irritate the Holy Spirit. Don't make him sad. How do you make the Holy Spirit? How do you grieve the Holy Spirit? By doing something wrong. Yeah, by doing something you know you shouldn't be doing. That grieves God's Spirit. Why does that grieve God's Spirit? Because we're disobedient. It's disobedience, absolutely. The Holy Spirit's, one of his primary goals is to help us live a life of Christ, a life pleasing to God. And he's helping us do that. He's giving us God's thoughts. He's encouraging us. He's bringing the word to our memory. And when we do something we shouldn't do, we're basically telling the Holy Spirit, I'm not going to go where you want me to go. I'm going to go where I want to go. I mean, if you had a little kid and you were leading them down the path and you are taking them where you want to be, school teacher trying to help your students, and you've got a kid saying, I don't care what you're telling me. I don't care that two plus two is four. I don't believe that. I think it's seven. And it's going to be seven on my test, and you just got to accept what I said. <laughs> that sounds right, doesn't it? It does. Well, think about it. That's what we're telling God. When we decide I'm going to do things my way and not yours. And the Holy Spirit's there saying, Listen, four, two plus two is four. Two plus two is four. So will you just shut up? I want two plus two to be seven. Show your work. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you get baptized, I you get to feel that Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guides you along that way. But when you get baptized, you actually, to me, I got a different feeling at that point in time when you get baptized. Sure you can. You, there's something different in yes. the Holy Spirit comes in. And we should have some sense of, I'm a different person than I used to be. I'm not the same guy. Even if you thought you were a nice person, even if you lived a good life, even if you were a nice neighbor, and mowed your neighbor's lawn, and gave money to the poor, and all that kind of stuff, when you repent of your lifestyle, whether it was good or bad, to say, I'm going to live the way God wants me to live, you should feel something. You should have some acknowledgement somewhere along the way. And I'm not saying everybody has a Damascus Road experience where the lights flash and all that kind of stuff. There should be some sense and some peace in your heart that says, I'm right with God. I'm doing what he wants me to do. I'm living what he wants me to live. And I'm going to heaven with him. But we've got to make that change. That's the repentance Peter's talking about. Of living for my life. Telling Christ, I don't care who you are, I don't want you. Changing that and saying, I'm going to live for you. You're my Messiah. I'm going to do what you want. And that's a challenge for every one of us for the rest of our lives. Is to live the way God wants us to live. Act the way he wants us to act. Show him up to people. Any other thoughts about this? Are we good? So what was the early church devoted to? Let's read the rest of the chapter. Somebody read for us 42 to the end of the book. In the chapter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll forgive you for that. Somebody else read for us. Okay. They okay. devoted okay. themselves to the okay. apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Thanks. So what's the early church devoted to? Themselves and the apostles' teaching. And what else? Fellowship, Fellowship. prayer, Fellowship. breaking of bread. Those things we preached through some months ago. The apostles' doctrine, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. So tell me what those things are. What is the apostles' doctrine? To be with other Christians. Okay, but generally speaking, what is the apostles' doctrine? How would we define that today? 
if we're going to devote ourselves today to the apostles' doctrine, what would we devote ourselves to? The teaching. Yeah, teach, what teaching? Who are we going to learn that teaching? From the Bible. From the yeah. Scripture. We're going to study the Bible. Right? Isn't this the apostles' doctrine? Can you get it from anywhere else? No. No, you can't. This is it. This is the apostles' doctrine. So if we're going to be like the first century church, I guess we should talk about what does devoted mean? Committed. Committed? Okay. Spent spent a, spent a lot of time. Spent a lot of time. Okay. Study. Study. I want to... Understood. Understood. Acted. Reminds me of that song from... What was that Olivia Newton John song? Totally devoted to you. Yeah. Uh, totally devoted to yeah, you. Loyal. <laughs> yeah, I want that. I'm going to do whatever I got to do to acquire this. So the question that all of us have to ask ourselves: Am I devoted to the apostles' doctrine? Do I put in the time to learn all I can about what the Bible says? Or do I just worry about it when I show up in Bible class? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, this is, if it will be like the first century church and do what they were committed to doing, they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine. How do you think they did that? They met daily. Pardon? They met daily. Okay, how they, does that help them learn the apostles' yeah. doctrine? Was their study, their talking, okay. their understanding, they, they were their communicating. under an apostle, and they probably broke the apostles into different groups, and God spread the, the gospel, the doctrine, okay. in, in those groups. So they were meeting in their homes. Yep. yep. Daily. Yep. What else? They also went to the temple. They, they, went, they went to the temple as well? Yep. What are they doing there? Listening to the apostles teach. Okay. And, and doing what else? Uh, probably having communion. Probably not in the temple. Not in the temple. <laughs> probably not in the temple. Fellowshipping. And Fellowshipping. Fellowship. And what else? Praying. Praying, Pray. certainly. Yeah. What else? What's the one thing we're missing? Don't you think they were telling others about the apostles' doctrine? Yeah. If I would think that if they were in the temple studying, fellowshipping, mm-hmm. that the people that were in there were already understood oh, the no. apostles. Oh, no. Oh, no. The, the Jews were the temple. Because the non believing Jews were yeah. the temple. And, and eventually, my notes down here say that eventually they were thrown out of the temple. And they will be. We'll see that in the next chapter. Chapter 3. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it. But don't you think if these people are so devoted to what the apostles said, they're sharing it with others. They're not just walking around talking to other Christians. That's why the church grows daily. Why is it growing daily? Because these early Christians are telling people they know. They're going from house to house. They're talking to their mom and their dad and their kids and their uncles and aunts and the guy that sells goats on the corner. Let me tell you what I know. Jesus is the Messiah. And they're excited about it. And they want people to know. So they're not just learning it so they can come fill out a form on Wednesday night. They're learning it so they can go tell people who Jesus is. I think that was at the forefront of their lives. They were so excited. They were making disciples. They were making disciples. Which is what Jesus tells us to do. Go into all the world and make disciples. And if I'm devoted to the Bible, if I'm devoted to what this stuff says, then I want to share with somebody else. I want to help others learn what the truth is. So they're devoted to the apostles' doctrine. They're committed. They're doing what they can. They're sharing it. How are you devoted to fellowship? How are you what? Show How are you devoted to fellowship? Showing up. Love your neighbor. Okay, let me know. What did you say, Susan? Showing up. Showing up. Yeah, love your neighbor. Show up. Be where other people are, which is what they're doing. They're meeting daily, house to house. They're doing stuff together. You know, and I think here at Central, we're doing better at that. We have a lot of opportunities to do stuff here at Central Christian Church. Thank you, John. And we have a lot of chances to just come together and do things as a church family. And most of us do. I think John did account for me the other day. It was like 80-something percent of our church members do something other than show up on Sunday morning. I would say without any wrong pride at all that there's probably not another church in our community that has that kind of an honor. 
I just don't. Most churches don't. They go to church on Sunday. They may show up on Wednesday. Maybe. Maybe. But that's not it. If they got they will show up. <laughs> but most churches don't have the opportunity the Central Christian Church is offering right now. And a lot of it's these outreach things John's putting together for us, and some of us are driving complaining things. I think you're tired to do this. And you don't have to do everything. Don't feel pressured to say, i got to do everything that the church is doing. You don't. But we need to fellowship with each other. If you can come here on Sunday morning and not give a hoot about ever seeing anybody else from Central Christian Church till the next Sunday, you're not devoted to fellowship. Well, there's also the opportunities we have to do, devote ourselves to, to studies. I mean, you know, the small groups that we have, the Bible studies, the, the individual studies that we have going on as well, uh, the elders meeting. We have a lot of opportunities. Yes. And, and I think, again, if you can go all week long and you don't care about seeing anybody else, you're not devoted to fellowship. You're not devoted to much anything. You're just doing, you're checking off that box. I went to church on Sunday. I'm okay. They didn't want these people did, Paul. You know, fellowship could be a little bit different. If you go to Jerusalem and go to the wall, the men are on one side and the women on the other side. And we're going to cover that on Monday yeah. nights. And there, 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 next week. Yeah, you know, <laughs> churches are in church in the United States the same way, but the men sit on one side and women sit on the other side. If they were all there at the same time, but it's, I don't call that fellowship type of thing. You're not mixing together. Yeah. But I don't think that's what you see yeah. here at the end of Acts chapter 2. Yeah. I yeah. think yeah. they're going house to house in Acts chapter 2. Yeah. They're fellowshipping with each other. There were still cultural issues, certainly there were. And in the synagogues, in this first century, the women sat on one side, the guys sat on the other side. That is it. The point is here, they're fellowship. They're getting together through doing things together. And even if it was men on one side, women on the other side, they were coming together to do that. And then all the men were fellowshipping and all the women. Yeah, maybe, but they were doing, doing it the way they thought was. You know, that, prob that probably created problems when they met in the Courts too, because the men and the women were together. Yeah, were they? No question. Yeah, no question. The Jews are looking at them thinking, yeah. wait a minute, you men are letting these women discuss the Bible with you? Mm -hmm. you know, you're talking gospel, you're talking religion with a woman? Yeah, I, that's, they probably did struggle with that as well. well that was a, a sense of persecution, potentially. Yes, it absolutely was. You're letting women do things that are supposed to do. And how dare you do that? But if you're devoted to fellowship, you want to be with other Christians. Male or female. Straight, with male or female, boy or girl, man or woman. Because you want to be together. You want to draw that strength from each other. And to me, that's one of the neat things about Bible studies and small groups. Is you don't have a chance to say whatever you want to say. You know, if you bring up my classes, you know, I, I let you say whatever you want. And we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. I take that. I just take you saying that for Monday night now. I just take you saying that. Because Monday night is going to be probably quite rough. Yeah, I take that. It's recorded. It's recorded. Monday night's going to be fine. I'm looking forward to it. Me too. But if, if we're fellowshipping together, we're doing things together. We want to be together. We're not happy just meeting on Sunday morning and never seeing each other for the rest of the week. So how do you devote yourself to breaking the bread? Here's my favorite. I love. Amen. <laughs> Fifth Sunday meals. Celebrate what God did for us. Celebrate what God, God did. did. You know, yeah. we did this once, I think, Bob, many years ago. Well, we actually had a meal. I had a Wednesday night meal, I think, and somewhere in the midst of it, we stopped and we did communion. Just because I think that's what the first century church did yeah. regularly. Yeah. As they're sitting around their tables fellowshipping with each other and they're getting ready to break the bread. I really believe many of those people stopped and said, you know, that's what Jesus did. And as we break this bread, let's be reminded, Jesus, his body was broken for us. And as they're drinking their wine goblets, it's, you know, this is what Jesus taught, that this cup represents his blood that was shed for us. Let's remember that as we drink this wine. We miss out, I think. We, we've totally made church a Sunday morning event for the most part. And that's when we do communion. And I don't think you get reading through Acts the idea that this church only remembered the blood and bread of, of Jesus on Sunday morning and had a little bit of cup, you know, a little bit of wafer. And 
That's all we did. I don't think that's for I think they did it regularly. Every day as they're eating, they're thinking as they pick. And maybe the problem is we don't eat bread like that. <laughs> Why like that anymore? Right. But as they broke that bread for dinner, I just see them thinking, you know, this reminds me Christ broke his body for us. And it became a continual remembrance that the only reason we're saved is because of what Jesus did. Some of us can go all week without ever once thinking, the only reason I'm saved is because of what Jesus did. Because we're not, we don't have these reminders. We don't have anything bringing it to our memory. Because we're not together enough and doing the kind of things enough. That draws that to our mind. You know, Bob, with the communion thing, I'm not so sure that he meant there should be some sort of ceremony. Not that I'm saying that's a bad thing. Right. But you just said we could go a week without thinking about him. Most people can't go a week without eating and drinking. Of course they can. I think his point was, as often as you eat, yes. at the very least, you should think about my sacrifice. Because he knows we have to eat. You, you can't go too long without eating or drinking. So I, I suspect his point was not to have some sort of ceremony that we argue over when we should or should not do it, <laughs> but to remember him as often as we eat and drink. I agree. Absolutely right, Scott. We've screwed it up because we've let formal yeah. church, <laughs> you know, formal religion has messed this up, and we've made communion a sacrament. I blame the Catholic. I think I just, <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure they're the ones Again, that started. Right? They're the ones I think that started. They, they started the Sunday thing too. They are. Before they came along, mm -hmm. we were rolling with Saturdays, and they ruined and that. Maybe Tuesday, Wednesday, and everything else. Yeah, but, but you're absolutely right. I think. With communion. I don't think for a minute most people got together on Sunday morning and said, here's this tray with these little cups and stuff, and in the middle of our singing and preaching and stuff, we're going to stop and do this. I don't think that happened. I think it's exactly what you said, that every meal, as they met, house to house every day, and they had that loaf of bread, and maybe that's our problem. We need to stop eating sliced bread. We need to have people bake bread for us. Every time you break it open, it's I'm reminded that Jesus Christ shed his blood and broke his body for me. Every time I drink my Diet Coke, except that's not fruit of the vine. But yeah, why can't I, as I drink my soda here, think, you know, Jesus took a cup. And the contents of it represented his blood. And if we would do that more often, if every, every time, could you imagine every time you had a meal, in the middle of eating that food, you stopped and thought, as I break my lasagna open, <laughs> Jesus had his body broken for me. As you're drinking your buttermilk or your tea or your coffee or whatever you're drinking, whatever it is. I like buttermilk. You're thinking, you know, whatever's in this cup can represent the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, I mean, shed, shed for me. But I think you're right. It doesn't have to be wine and bread. It doesn't have to be whatever or brings us grape juice or crackers. It doesn't matter. No. No. Yeah. But we've made it such a Holy a Sunday thing that it's a an ordinance and, and it's a ceremony that we will argue with people about. We do argue yeah. with people about it. Which is definitely not what he wanted us to do. Of course, the church I grew up in, you could only do communion on Sunday. Mm -hmm. You don't dare do communion on Thursday. Really? Really? Because yeah. Acts chapter 20, verse 7 says, on the first day of the week, they gathered together to break bread. And that is the one example that you can only do it on Sunday morning. And, and we, we fall over that. You can't have a wedding on Saturday and have the bride and groom take communion because that's not Sunday. You're not in church. And they even argued over, can we do it Sunday night for the people who miss Sunday morning? Our church did that. And, and many churches do it. Some people thought, you can't do it unless the whole church does. Because these people aren't doing it with the rest of us. They're doing it by themselves. I mean, it's, we argue about some of the stupid things. It's what it, what it really, it really means. It has nothing to do with yeah, what it really means. Yeah. That's absolutely right. We lost sight we lost, of we, what it means yes. instead of we have to argue over how much we think we know. Yeah, we've checked off the box. I took communion. Or how often you do it. Like, you know, some churches do it once every quarter exactly. or, yeah. Once, yeah. Every or once every fifth month. Sunday or yeah, whatever. There's, there's people that would come in here and just be blown away that we do it every Sunday. Whoa, what's wrong with you? And some of you have had people ask you about that. You know, sure. Why do you do this every week? Then they get monotonous. 
you know, and it doesn't if you don't let it. But I think you're right, Scott. This these people did it every time they came together. Sure. They were reminded at their meal. Christ had his body broken for us. Christ had his blood shed for us. And can you imagine how much a stronger Christian we would all be if every time we ate, we sat around and talked about what Jesus had done for us and how that bread and that drink can remind us of what Jesus had done. How much stronger the church would be today? How much stronger we would be Absolutely. as believers? Yes. It, 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 would be more, it would have to. He's more in our faith. Have to strengthen our faith. Yeah. Because I'm reminded all the time. Because you're right. You eat two or three times a day. If every <laughs> meal I took. <laughs> at least. About that at least two or three times a day. Yeah. <laughs> as many times as we can. Can you imagine? And even if you're eating broccoli and carrots, you're And that helps so much up. What's wrong with that? <laughs> Nothing's wrong with it. But can you imagine if you snap that carrot and thought, you know, Jesus had his body broken just like that. And as you're drinking your health punch or whatever, you know, this could represent the blood of Jesus. How much better Christians we would be if we were just do that? And maybe I'm just going to challenge us. Take a week. And every time you have a meal, stop during that meal somewhere along the way with your family or whoever you're eating with. And just say to your family or whoever you're eating, even if you eat by yourself, say it to you. You know, as I get ready to take a bite of this sandwich, if my teeth break through that bread, I'm reminded those nails broke through the body of Jesus. As I get ready to drink my Coke Zero, I'm just reminded that that juice that I'm about to drink, Jesus could represent a remembrance to me that Christ died for me. I just challenge us to do that for a week and see what happens. See if we can bring this remembrance back to us. That's what this first church did. They were devoted to this. Not just on Sundays because it was a thing to do. They did it by the way. It meant something. Else. Last one's the prayers. What do you think that is? They were in prayer to God. Okay, they prayed a lot. They were probably thanks thankful for their forgiveness. I would hope so. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. we're sure. praising God for uh, for the forgiveness and for all the miracles that they were yeah. seeing happen. Yeah, you know, these Jews and I can't even grasp how they must have thought. They've gone two thousand years waiting for a Messiah. He shows up. And to the Jews, Christ is the epitome of God's promise to them. It's the promise of Abraham from 2000 B.C. finally showing up here in 33 A.D. It's been fulfilled in my lifetime. The Messiah that's mentioned all the way through this Old Testament, not Old Testament to them, all the way through the prophets and, and all that. He finally showed up and I got to see it. Can you imagine being a Jew and, and living through that? I, I can't. I can't even imagine what it must be like. Maybe it's like Tennessee beat Alabama. You know, that kind of emotional response. Wow. 2,000 years and the Messiah came in my lifetime. I have now learned about him. I killed him, and I wish I hadn't. But he's forgiven me for that. And I can have a life with him now. Can you imagine how, how it must have felt to those first century Jews who lived through that time span. They saw the Messiah. The one Moses talked about. The one David talked about. The one Joel talked about. They saw him. And now they're living for him instead of whatever. But they prayed about it. They worshiped God. We don't do enough. We, we're not devoted to much of anything sometimes. And we do what we do, but I don't know that we're devoted. We just need to get going. We need to make what we're doing here the primary thing in our life. It would make a difference for every one of us if we did that. Other thoughts? Got one more thing to throw into this just to mess things up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> the original Greek put 
notice the article V in front of each one of these. They were committed to the Apostles' Doctrine, to the Fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayer. And some commentaries will read say, it wasn't just they're committed to prayer, or they're committed to fellowship. They're committed to this fellowship. They're committed to this Apostles' Doctrine. They're committed to these prayers. And they bring up, because we'll see in the next chapter, the Peter and John are headed to the temple to do what? Teach. Pray. Right. You're on the way to pray. Wait a minute. These are Jews, Christians, and they're going to the temple to pray, and that's what we're going to talk about next week. But the prayers probably are the Jewish prayers that these people did. Ninth hour? Sixth hour? They got together and prayed just like the Muslims do today. They were committed to that, to the prayers. You know, I was going to ask you, you know, Jesus tells us how we should pray and Matthew 7, I believe it is. It, it's, it's a pretty simple, pretty easy yeah. prayer. You know, and I was going to ask you what exactly they were, how extensive their prayers were. But I guess what you said, I mean, that, that completely makes sense. Didn't they have big scrolls that they rolled out? And, yeah, they had prayers that they said. Right. Yeah, and they had certain prayers you said in the morning, certain prayers you said in the afternoon. And there wasn't anything wrong with that. But they were devoted to doing it. And probably before that, as Jews, eh, we'll skip the noon hour. I mean, I don't have time to go to the temple and pray. Eh, you know, it's 3 in the afternoon. It's hot. I don't want to walk down the street to the temple to pray. These people were committed to the prayers. They recognized that there's a part of my life we've been missing out on. And I'm going to be devoted to these religious activities because I now accept Jesus Christ as my Messiah. It just seems to me in this chapter, we miss a lot because we don't let Christianity be the focal point of what we do. We had all kinds of stuff getting away. And I think we're the losers for that. We've missed out on the greatest blessings we could have by putting all this other stuff in front of God. I got to work. I got to mow my lawn. I got to take my kids to school. I, like Paul says, all these things that distract us, we let them get in the way. And so Christ, we have a hard time being devoted to Him. Because we've got all this other stuff. So are you saying that, that Peter and John were on their way to the temple to pray the Jewish prayers? I think they're fulfilling the Jewish tradition. They're and still Jewish. They, they were still. They were still thinking that uh, they needed to follow the yeah. many of the Paul. Jewish traditions. I think so. Until Paul so yeah. that's great. I think so. Okay. I think, and I think those are the prayers they're committed to. They, that's why they're going to the temple to pray. That's what it says in Acts chapter 3. They're going up there to pray. Well, why are they doing that? Because they're Jews. They're good Jews. And they're doing what good Jews do. They're going to the temple to pray. And again, I don't... I don't think they would have been the same prayers probably, Bob, because I think we now recognize we got some celebrating to do. We're going to the temple and praise God through our prayers that the Messiah is coming. We know who he is. Yeah, I don't think they were praying to the law of Moses anymore. But they were going to the temple to pray because that's what the Jews did. They went to the temple to pray. He would hurt us to pick up some of those habits. You know, have some regular prayer at the time. And maybe, you know, if you're like me, Everything gets in the way of prayer, too. You get so busy, you're worn out at night thinking, I'm tired, i got to go to bed. I'm going to say a prayer while I'm laying on my pillow. You know, and before you know it, you've got three words down and you're snoring. We're not devoted to prayer either. We pray when we think we need to. We may pray at lunch. We may pray if we're in big trouble. But for the most part, prayer just sort of gets passed by until it's the right time to do it. Well, I think we use it as a spare tire. It can be a spare tire. When we're in trouble, we need a replacement, we'll ask God for help. And if something really cool is going on, we may be remembering enough to say thank you. you know? But for the most part, I don't think we're devoted to prayer. It's something that comes along every once in a while when we've got time to mess with it. These people, the Bible says, were devoted to these four things. I think if we were a church and we would devote ourselves to these four things, what a different lifestyle we would see, not just in our lives, 
the lives of the people we come in contact with. We would be sharing the message everywhere we went. We would not be afraid that somebody would look at us weird because we ask them if they go to church somewhere. If they ask them, if we ask them if they know Jesus. But we're not bold enough to do that. Because we're not devoted to do those things. Well, you know, you know else, like I said, part of your prayer, you, you say praise to God because sure. look what He's given us compared to what it was 2,000 years ago in the Bible, in the New Testament. So, yeah, that should be part of our prayer. Thank, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We don't even do that enough. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for everything you do for us. I do pray for Brian and Shannon as they're not here this evening. I pray you protect them where they may be. And God, just let them know we missed them. Be with Teresa. She's flying back this weekend. Protect her as well. Thank you for giving Bob the knowledge and wisdom to be able to uh, teach his class. And 
I pray that we would be devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayer, God. Help us take Bob's challenge of remembering your death at every time, every meal we have, every opportunity we have to remember that this coming week. I pray that will help us be stronger Christians, stronger in faith than you. We thank you for your sacrifice for, for us, God. Give you all the praise in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Oh, okay, John, I have a question. Oh,